Super Smash Bros. Melee was released on the Nintendo GameCube in 2001. And oh, what a fantastic game it was, and still is. We know this game for being incredibly fast, technically demanding, and extremely hard to master due to its complex defense. But it took a while for the game to get to this point. If you take a look at some games from the earlier years of Melee, you can see how much slower and simpler the game truly was. As all competitive metagames, Melee has evolved over time, but it truly has evolved to a totally different game than what it was even seven years ago. As the technical ability of players are constantly increasing, one glaring flaw of Melee became noticeable, and that's the controllers that we play on. The GameCube controller has a lot of irregularities that it can come with, making some tricks harder to do on one controller compared to another. Around 2016 is when players started to become more aware of the inconsistencies of the GameCube controller, as well as how hard it became to find a well-manufactured one for a good price. The community was filled with many people paying top dollar to get a well-made controller. Finding a controller quickly became one of the biggest challenges in Melee, and the community was desperately looking for an answer on how to improve these issues. So what did they come up with? At August 8th of 2017, Dan Salvato, the creator of Doki Doki Literature Club, released a video on YouTube announcing something that would change the future of Super Smash Bros. Melee forever. This day was the introduction of Universal Controller Fix, or UCF, to the public Melee community. I say to the public community because before this video came out, a bunch of high-level Melee modders, tassers, and players were working on this project for a while in order to achieve two major goals. One is to fix the imperfections of the GameCube controller to allow players with unmodified or inherently worse controllers than their opponents to perform basic movements that the game is programmed to do. And two, to fix these imperfections without drastically changing the code of the game or hardware slash software it is being played on, and without creating more barriers to entry for any other competitor. Wow, I'm gonna be the first to say that those are some pretty dense goals right there, but keep them in mind as we will be returning to them every now and then. I also want to address the elephant in the room. What exactly is meant by the imperfections of the GameCube controller? You see, some controllers have loose sticks, others have tighter sticks, button quality can vary between controllers, the notches on your controller may not be the same as the notches on another controller, and a whole bunch of other issues that I don't really want to get into because there are so many. Players for a long time have been complaining about controller inconsistencies making it hard to perform basic movements. The two movements that were complained about the most were backdash and shield dropping. Pax Money has a whole video on the mechanics of backdash and melee that you can watch, but to simplify all the in-depth jargon he goes into, in Vanilla Melee, to perform a backdash, you need to bring your control stick from the dead zone to any of these values on the far sides of your controller stick in one frame. That is 1 60th of a second. Now honestly, it doesn't sound that bad. All you're doing is flicking the stick back real quick. But the main issue arises from how Melee handles input lag and how the polling rate can have issues reading certain inputs at certain frames. I'm not very well versed in this and you could go check out Hacks Money's video if you want a more in-depth look at it. But the point I want to make is, dashback in Vanilla Melee is a frame-perfect input. If the polling detects your control stick position in the middle box during the frame you backdash, you simply turn around instead of doing a dash animation. Honestly, this backdash issue was very common. The other piece of movement, the shield drop, is another very common melee technique. Although shield dropping is such a staple defensive movement option in contemporary melee, this technique was nowhere near as popular a decade ago. This meant that people knew less about the shield drop inconsistencies and that they knew about the backdash inconsistencies. But oh, there is a huge problem with vanilla melee shield drops. The issue with shield drop is that in vanilla melee, the area that your control stick needs to tilt towards is so small and specific 
that some controllers are straight up unable to shield drop, period. So I'd like you to go back in time and imagine how people felt losing a tournament game because they're constantly missing inputs while their opponent is hitting every backdash and every shield drop. People started to call Melee a pay-to-win game. You can never win a tournament with a bad controller, so how do you manage to get your hands on a good controller? That good old cash money, baby. Anyone who has looked at the market for good GameCube controllers online, whether it's from a seller online getting rid of their untouched controller, or a good third-party manufacturer, knows how prices can fluctuate based on the availability of certain controllers and how reliable their control sticks are. People were trying to find the perfect controller for Melee, but it wasn't just as simple as the more money you spend on a controller online, the better it will be. Some outside help was needed. People were modding their controllers before UCF was a thing, but when UCF came out and people still struggled to do certain movements, people felt like they needed the mods. The first really popular controller mod that players gravitated towards was manually notching their controllers. Controller notching is a process of cutting more lines around the polygon that surrounds your control stick that can be used for certain reasons. Notching can be used to give you several buffs when playing with certain characters. For example, you can make notches in your controller to give you more precise Firefox and Firebird angles with space animals that are harder to hit. Some people also gave themselves notches that would make it easier to get a max length wave dash, which was very popular with characters like Ice Climbers and Luigi who have extremely long wave dashes. And some players even made notches on their C-Stick to allow them to effortlessly do angled smash attacks, allowing characters like Mario and Samus to hit below the ledge with a strong kill move. But by far, the most popular notches that were used prior to the UCF era were shield drop notches. Meaning that before UCF, if you wanted to consistently get shield drops, you either had to get really lucky with the controller you bought, or you had to pay someone to notch your controller for you, because if you do not have experience creating notches in your controller, it's quite easy to make notches that do absolutely nothing useful. Notching is still a very popular practice today. And if you're on a GameCube controller, you basically need additional notches in order to win a major on a GameCube controller. Overall, notching is not a controversial mod at all. Anyone should be able to customize their GameCube controller in any fashion they want, whether it's adding notches, removing the springs from your shield triggers, or replacing your control stick with a control stick from another controller like a Wii Nunchuck. But another form of controller modding was born soon after these basic forms of controller modding took off, and it will forever live in infamy. The Arduino Nano is an additional piece of hardware that can be added onto your controller chip in order to change how your controller reads certain inputs. You can add macros, you can make it so that your control stick goes left, it goes right instead, and you can remap your buttons to do different actions. It's quite a drastic change to go from cutting lines on the edges of your control stick shield to splicing a whole piece of equipment into your controller that allows you to do things that no one else can. For a very small period of time, before UCF was ever even thought of, Arduino Nanos were championed as being the future of controller fixes by a minority of Melee enthusiasts. One of these Arduino believers we mentioned before, Hacks F Money. He released a whole video on his channel going over the use of Arduinos and controllers as a first big time solution to Melee's controller issues. By this point you're probably wondering how this is all done, so let me show you. Everything I've shown you in the video is done through an Arduino Nano that has been soldered to the GameCube controller. In fact, I personally have a really funny story surrounding Arduino Nanos and Hacks Money. Back when Arduinos were first starting to get popular, I thought to myself, what if I want an Arduino Nano? Luckily, Hacks came to the local that week and heard me talking about it, and he said, hey man, I could hook you up with an Arduino no problem. I said thanks, and I gave him my spare controller to see what he can do with it, and I'll see him next week if he has it. So next week rolls by, and we both show up at the local, and he has it. My new and improved god-tier Arduino controller. He gives it to me, and goes on his merry way before bracket starts. 
When I sit down next to someone to play friendlies, I plug in my controller and it starts rumbling. And it just doesn't stop. I go to Hex and I say, Yo dude, my controller is just rumbling. How did you not notice this? The dude just looks at me and grins and he said, But yo, did you try your Firefox angles though? And he was right. This controller literally felt like I could do any Firefox angle that I wanted without the need of notches. I did unironically use this controller before back in tournaments and it wasn't really my best controller and I'm not very used to rumble so I'm not going to get any good wins on it but yeah, that is a controller that I prided. And I wish that I could show you this controller today but it did die out from the insane amounts of rumbling that I had to go through. To make the Arduino short story even shorter, it quickly got banned, mainly due to the potential to give yourself access to button macros. A macro is when one button results in the game reading two input values at the same frame that the button was pressed. This is a really popular feature in fighting games, and Smash Bros even has macros. Well, just one official macro. If you press Z, you go for grab, and grab is a combination of shield and A attack inputs. This is why it's possible to light shield with Z and why you can also do aerials with Z. These custom Arduino macros can open up opportunities for players that are not accessible through a regular GameCube controller. Macros may have killed the Arduino's shot at getting legalized, but before the death of the Arduino, it started a really important discussion. The viability of Z-Jump. One thing that players tried when installing an Arduino into their controller was by changing their jump button from Y or X to be Z. Why Z? Well, Z-Jump is good because it allows you to not press a jump button with your thumb. One of the reasons why players such as Javi or Whiskers play with a claw grip is to allow them to act out of jump easier and as soon as possible. With Z-Jump being a thing, it basically makes claw gripping your controller useless, since having Z set to jump allows you to jump with your index fingers and lets the player not have to lay their index fingers over their jump button for the whole game. It allows for a lot of things to be easier with a ton of characters. For example, Fox can have a way easier time shining out of shield since the player no longer needs to slide their thumb from Y to B or from X to B in a quick succession. We'll talk more about Z-Jump later in another section, but now, let's talk about stuff that has nothing to do with GameCube controllers. On March 1st, 2017, the Kickstarter for the Smashbox was posted, along with a trailer video for it on YouTube. The Smashbox was basically taking the GameCube controller and pasting it onto a fight pad. The idea was to create a controller that was comfortable for players who have difficulties gripping a handheld controller from conditions such as Carpal Tunnel. But at the same time, Hitbox Arcade, the company that developed the Smashbox, knew the potential that a box-style controller had for improving the future of Melee. Not only was the Smashbox made primarily with ergonomics in mind, but the controller not having any sticks meant that all of your inputs on this controller are registered as digital signals instead of analog signals. Analog components on your controllers are capable of recording a multitude of different values depending on how much the component is being pushed. On a GameCube controller, there are four analog components. The analog stick, the C stick, and the L and R shoulder buttons. The many values in the analog stick allow you to walk or run, or do whatever the hell this is. It also allows you to tilt your shield precisely or roll or spot dodge out of shield. The analog values of your C-Stick are pretty much only useful for either tilting or rolling or spot dodging out of shield, since any value outside of shield results in a smash attack. Shielding is affected by the multiple values that the analog shoulder buttons provide, since holding a shield button all the way results in a normal shield. But the lighter you press the button, you'll notice that the shield actually gets bigger. This is a light shield, and is quite a necessary part of defensive play in Melee. It gives you a bigger and stronger shield with the added benefit of increasing your traction, making it easy for players to safely slide off of a platform when their shield is hit by an attack. But light shielding comes with the negative effect of giving you more shield stun when being hit, making it easier to get stuck 
or to have your movement hindered by shield. Digital inputs only have two values that they can represent. Either they are pressed and perform an action, or they are not pressed and don't perform an action. It's quite simple, really. Well, we see how important analog inputs can be in Melee. So why is it that digital-only inputs are considered revolutionary? First of all, the Smashbox also has analog modifier buttons for what would be your analog stick and shoulder buttons, allowing Smashbox players to still have their immediate access to walk, shield tilt, shield drop, and light shield. This means that the lack of those analog components on this controller doesn't even really matter. The thing that truly makes digital inputs so great, however, is the concept of the 1.0 Cardinal. I briefly mentioned the 1.0 Cardinal in my previous video, The Ugly Sides of Melee. If you haven't seen that, go check it out. I'm not gonna lie, I'm gonna be here all day. Maybe not all day, but maybe for just as long as the video runs, I guess. But I'm going to cover why 1.0 Cardinal is so important. To refresh, the 1.0 Cardinals are the extreme north, south, east, and west ends of the analog stick. On a normal melee controller, the 1.0 Cardinal is usually not possible to hit consistently or hit at all. The Smashbox basically makes it possible to hit the 1.0 Cardinals every time, since the digital inputs input the maximum analog value in whatever direction you press. 1.0 Cardinal also allows you to input the maximum stick values for certain kinds of DI, which ultimately is not very important, but hey, it's something else 1.0 Cardinal can help you do. The Smashbox and its design aided in revolutionizing controllers for Melee for the rest of its life. Despite how revolutionary it was, you never really see this controller get used in current day tournaments, which is weird considering that the Kickstarter was very successful and a majority of backers paid to get access to the controller. It turns out that the design of basically flattening out a GameCube controller on the box so that they can get a similar layout is not very ergonomic, despite the ergonomics of the controller being the primary selling point. The layout of the controller kind of turned people off, particularly Hacks Money, the Arduino master. Hacks helped the Hitbox team produce the Smashbox controller. However, when he tried to bring up to the rest of the Hitbox team his issues with the controller's layout, he was quickly shut down by the rest of the team. I will always stand by every move I made to get here, as without me and the box team, the consumer would be pigeonholed into buying an incomplete product from a company that is only interested in your money. The Smashbox team has had the audacity to publicly accuse me of only caring about myself and money. What's up guys, it's Editor Juice Man. I just want to say that this Smashbox drama between the Hitbox team and Hacks was a pretty big one, and to this day, the dust has never seemed to settle between the two, particularly the battle between Hacks and Florida Captain Falcon player Gravy. Gravy was another lead working on the controller who did not take too kindly to Hacks' suggestions, and particularly Hacks' attitude. According to Gravy, Hacks was just really hard to work with. Hax expressed to the team that he did not like the layout of the Smashbox, although the team did tell him that this controller is only a prototype and that they are working on another layout. This was clearly stated by Dustin Huffer in the Smashbox trailer. The box you're seeing now that's been circulating in the Smash scene is our proof of concept build, and it's incomplete right now. We've been taking notes along the way, and we've been working closely with professional players and ergonomic specialists to help bring the final version into focus. I just thought that I should put that out there because it wasn't on the original script for some reason, but yeah, take it back, Juice Man. This caused him to cut ties with the Smashbox team and start his own controller venture, The Box. This is what I've been playing on for the past few days. This is our current model, which, um, as you can see, we've made um, plenty of improvements to the, to the uh, Smashbox's original layout. Then he had to play Leffen, who absolutely tossed him yesterday. Yeah, he did. And Hacks wins 3-1. 3-1. Yes. And I'm thinking to myself... Oh my God! Oh! These controller developers now knew the power of digital-only inputs. Now the goal was to maximize its ergonomic potential. Hacks' idea of the most ergonomic controller design was to lay out the buttons like this. When compared to the Smashbox controller, you can start seeing the glaring weaknesses between the Smashbox and the box. For example, the Smashbox put all four cardinal directions on the left side of the controller, while the box keeps up on the right side of the controller. 
This is to remove the tension in your fingers when you inevitably have to move your fingers around to press up. Up being on the right side of the controller serves as an alternate jump button and effectively as a DI up button without drastically changing the position of your left fingers. Another key difference is the A button being placed with the C-Stick inputs, as this regulates all of your normals to being accessible by your thumb. These changes and the fact that Hax was the one overseeing the controller development were enough to easily persuade players that this was the better controller overall. But the controller's potential would not fully be recognized until October of 2018, where the controllers were first put on the market for players to buy. The potential of these box controllers were kind of insane. Remember how I said box controllers get a huge benefit from being able to consistently hit 1.0 Cardinal? Well, that's not the only crazy benefit that these controllers have. Box controllers, specifically the box when it first came out, were called out for being incredibly broken for the fact that it can do things consistently that other controllers cannot perform. The box developers definitely had the option to add a modifier button that gives you the perfect angle for a max length wave dash every single time, but nerfed the controller to prevent this. But that's just one thing that the developers thought of. There's also up tilt out of crouch being significantly easier to perform, and this option honestly opens up an incredible amount of both offensive and defensive options for many characters in the game that is not really possible on a controller unless you specifically practice this tech for 5 years straight or some shit. This led to the box being nerfed again by implementing timed button lockouts, making the player unable to perform a desired input after another specific input has been performed in order to promote fair play. Another thing that the box is incredible at allowing you to do is perform SDI that you've never seen before. What? Wait, no what? fucking way. Since your DI is being input through the 1.0 cardinal and the fact that you can easily go from holding one direction on the controller to another direction on the controller makes it so that you can get out of combos easier than a GameCube controller with analog inputs. This resulted in another time lockout implementation for SDI, nerfing the controller even further. Also, to prevent literally all of your wave dashes from looking the same, there is another nerf where the modifier button can randomly generate an analog coordinate within a set number of possible coordinates. This in itself is another nerf, since it basically adds RNG to the controller. But yeah, at least these box players could know what it feels like to not get your exact inputs every time. Now there are plenty more box nerfs that I don't really feel like getting into because there are a ton of videos on YouTube specifically from Aziz Alyami that go over every single box nerf. But from here, I can introduce you to the box's main market rival, the Frame 1. On September 11th of 2020, Steven Kazmir, better known as Greg Turbo in the Smash community, made his own box controller, the Frame 1, available for pre-order. And this box controller shook up the market. I've talked a lot so far about all the benefits that these box controllers can bring, but one thing I haven't talked about are the prices of these controllers. The Smashbox is selling each controller for $250 before tax. The box is selling for $230 before tax. Meanwhile, the Frame 1 also sells for $250 before tax, but just the heavy version. Yes, there are multiple versions of this controller. The Frame 1 also has a light version selling for $150 before tax. So not only is the Frame 1 team challenging the box controller market, but it also has a cheaper alternative that players can buy that has the same button layout as the box. Some Frame 1 users even mentioned that the Frame 1 feels cleaner than a box, having better feeling buttons. There are also box players that say that the Frame 1 is actually better than the box because it doesn't have any nerves. This is actually propaganda. Well, sort of. The Frame 1 actually suffers from nerfs as well. They're just slightly different from the box nerfs from what I've been able to find. To start off, they both have basically the same nerf on pivot up tilt. But the first difference comes from how wave dash angles are determined. I mentioned earlier how the wave dash value is slightly randomized for the box, resulting in wave dashes having inconsistent lengths. Similar to how it would be wave dashing on a controller. 
Well, frame one wave dash mechanics also work the same way to prevent consistent perfect wave dashes. However, the wave dash values actually differ between the two controllers on an almost microscopic level, making one controller better for one character than another since wave dash links vary between characters. In reality, this doesn't really matter because it's very hard to tell between the differences of these values. However, there is one really big difference between the frame one and the box. Greg Turbo, the creator of the Frame 1 controller, found an issue with time button lockouts being implemented for STI. He said that this messes with too many other unrelated inputs. Now of all the nerfs for this controller to not implement, this one is easily the most controversial, since SDI being easier on this controller means you can find your way out of combos way easier than you can on a controller, allowing you to survive for longer. We've seen people do some crazy SDI inputs on controller. It's not like it's not possible. And there are techniques that you can use on controller to get better SDI results. But box style controllers allowing you to move with buttons gives you the ability to easily mash two directions that you need to move at back and forth to get out of an attack. This is the primary reason why box players do not like the frame one as it does not follow the same SDI nerfs as the box. If the lack of an SDI lockout is enough to convince you to buy a Frame 1 controller, I would suggest calming down a bit. You may not know this, but the only relationship that's worse than Will and Jada Smith's is the relationship that a Frame 1 buyer has with buying a Frame 1. Now mass producing, quality testing, and shipping out controllers all around the world is not the easiest task and there are a ton of factors that could affect this business. It's hard to keep controllers of this quality and size in stock, especially when there are people actually buying them. The Frame 1 business was also suffering from the global chip shortage, leaving the supply even more scarce. Some people like the Florida Falcon player Chef Rackman put in an order for a Frame 1 controller two years ago and still have not received an actual update on when they're gonna get their controller. It may be hard to buy a Frame 1 controller, but it doesn't change the fact that it is a great controller with its own unique strengths. However, the low supply, chip shortage, and the fact that it came to the market basically two whole years earlier than the box made the box outshine the Frame 1 in popularity. This doesn't mean that the Frame 1 doesn't see success though. Probably the greatest success story of the Frame 1 was having a Frame 1 user qualify for Smash Summit 8 months after its release date. For those who may not know, Smash Summit is arguably the most high level event in competitive Melee history. The format is simple. You take the top 10 players in the world and you put them together in a house for 4 days. There are 6 other players of various skill levels that are either qualified or invited to the tournament via donations. These 16 players would participate in a bunch of side events before getting into the serious brackets of singles and doubles. Not only was it just a house of pure melee skill, but any of these invitees can take advantage of all of the top players surrounding them, leveling up their play. It's also kind of the closest thing that we got to reality TV in the Smash community. Oh, oh. Is that, that's it? Nice from he threw oh, the, the, the German pop. He threw the oh, controller. Oh, the oh, yeah. Did I? The yeah, Arizona angle. Did he slam the door? Back. He brought it back. <laughs> oh, that was classic. Oh, classic. I want Sadly, Smash Summit announced that they aren't doing any more events and hosted their last Melee Summit, Smash Summit 14, from November 3rd to November 6th of 2023, which was iconically taken by Mango. Rest in peace, Smash Summit. You have no idea the wonders that you've brought to this community over the years. Thank you so much. And the next summit. And the yeah, next summit. Uh, we'll next see everyone at home there. But thank you so much for watching this weekend. Peace. But yeah, a Frame 1 user found themselves against the top level of competition. That player was Pipsqueak from Stockholm, Sweden, the same area that birthed Melee Legends Armada and Leffen. I'm not gonna lie, he kind of popped off here. He was seated third in his pool after losing 3-1 to Hungrybox and losing a close game 5 set against Cody Schwab, and by beating box player at the time, Tyler Swift in a game 5 set. 
He started off beating his first opponent of singles bracket, Free Palestine, 3-1 before falling 3-1 to his Swedish neighbor Leffen, and then losing to Magi 3-1 in loser side. Now this may not seem too crazy of a run, in fact it may seem mediocre to some spectators, but keep in mind that Pipsqueak was an invitee entering every single set at least taking one game off some of the best of the best players. He got 2nd at Giga Schwab 1 and 1st at Giga Schwab EU 3, 17th at Pound, 1st at Low Tide City, 2nd at Fate 2, 9th at Lost Tech City, 9th at the Big House 10, and 13th at the Ludwig Championship Series where he will beat Mango 3-1. I also want to point out that before Smash Summit 12, Pipsqueak also qualified to get into Summit 13, making him the first and only player to get invited to two Smash Summits in a row while being outside of the top 10 before the events even happened. Too bad Pipsqueak could not attend Summit 13 due to contracting COVID right before the tournament, causing the next invitee with the greatest amount of votes to enter. That player being Iron Spartan 696. Smash Summit 13! Alright? I want to be there on the big stage! I want to be there and be with the greats! I want that level up, and I want to touch the hearts of the people that climb. Pipsqueak would end up being ranked 24th in the world by the summer of 2022, and would go up to be ranked 20th by the end of the year. Unfortunately though, Pipsqueak hasn't had much opportunity to leave Sweden to attend American tournaments as of late, leaving him totally unranked for the year of 2023. Oh, yeah. oh in the pop off. But not only do we now know the power of Pipsqueak as a player, we now know the viability of the Frame 1 as a controller. Other high level players such as Gatsu and Zealot seem to be using Frame 1 controllers. I might be wrong there, but I think those are Frame 1s. Despite the fact that this controller is actually good, there aren't too many high level players that have it over a box from what mainly either seems to be issues with buying the product, or that there are consumers that already bought the box and aren't willing to drop more money on a controller that is effectively the same thing, but slightly different I guess. Outside of technical nerfs, these controllers are straight up the same thing. So many people were focusing on the potential box controllers had with their digital inputs that they forgot the main reason these controllers were made. For ergonomic purposes. After Hacks revolutionized the box controller market by creating this layout as the standard for other box controllers such as the Frame 1 to use, some were thinking that there isn't much else that we can do to optimize the ergonomic design of a box controller. But then there was one vision. One Vision is a melee spacey player who saw the success of the Frame 1 and thought to themselves, what did Greg Turbo really do different? One Vision has their own version of a controller, one where you can use digital buttons without keeping your hands flat like it would be on a keyboard. This was how the next box style controller, the Prism, was born. The Prism takes the same layout that the box controller popularized, but instead of making it a flat box, it's in the shape of a prism. Honestly, when I first saw this controller, my thought was, oh my god, that is the most intimidating thing ever, it looks like an Indiana Jones artifact. But the more I thought about it, I realized how unique this concept is, and how revolutionary it is to the box controller market. I don't know exactly how proven this stuff is, but there are people who are big fans of this controller. The aforementioned box player Tyler Swift ended up making the switch to Prism, and I think the only tournament he's actually used the Prism has been LACS 5, where he qualified for top 8 after beating Khalid, Koopa Troopa, Sunsei, and Magi, before going down to Zayn and HBox, who he each took a game off of, which is insane because Pikachu vs Puff is a really hard matchup. Some players also hated on this controller for similar reasons that people hate the Frame 1 the lack of the SDI nerfs. Honestly, there were people saying that Swift was doing a bunch of crazy stuff on this Prism controller, but I just don't see it. If what you mean by crazy stuff is just being very consistent with their punish game and being great defensively, then yeah, Swift was playing absolutely amazing. 
but I'm not seeing anything that Pikachu players on controller cannot do. Outside of some weird SDI stuff here and there, but hey, good SDI is still possible on GameCube controller. Outside of Swift, I don't know any other top Melee players using this, but one other player that uses this controller is El Cocinero himself, Chef Rackman, who owns three of these fucking things. Those who use the Prism really vouch for it though, so it has to be the real thing. Perhaps we'll see a lot more of it within the next few years. I do want to say that I've been yapping about box controllers and digital inputs for a while now and only mentioned a few of the many box controllers that there are. For example, controllers such as the LBX by Junk Food Customs. This is not one of the more mainstream controllers, but despite that, people generally have really good things to say about it, especially complimenting its button feel. Another main factor of the LBX that people like is its price point being $185, a little more expensive than a Frame 1 Lite, but more affordable than any other box controller on the market pretty much. There are also more box controllers prepared for the future. One I particularly wanted to talk about is One Vision's new idea for a controller called the Schism. It's a controller that will incline just like the Prism, but the controller actually folds in on itself, doubling both as a controller and a controller case that can easily be carried and stored away in a backpack. They seem to be going on sale currently for $350, so if you're interested in trying what I think will be the biggest new controller on the market, go check out One Vision's website to order one. One Vision, please sponsor me. This last box style controller I want to discuss is an interesting one, and that is the Smash Stick. This was a Kickstarter controller that saw quite the amount of success, raising over $126,000 to help produce the controller. This controller was exciting for being the only Smash controller so far to utilize both an analog stick and an ergonomic flat button layout. Yo, Editor Juice Man just cutting in really quick just to say that this is not entirely a unique concept. In fact, the box has a nunchuck controller port that allows you to use the analog controller stick that's on the nunchuck. But yeah, this controller is a first for having an actual analog stick on the controller itself and not needing any other controller. But yeah, let's just continue. However, this controller saw many issues with development, with every single beta controller coming with a defective magnet in the control stick that was very prone to breaking. And these breaks were pretty serious, resulting in the controller reading your analog inputs wrong and preventing you from hitting crucial angles and shield drops. YouTuber Ziggy has a whole video covering this story on the Smash Stick controller, so if you're interested in that, I would recommend go checking that out. As box style controllers were getting major attention for seeming to be the future standard of melee controllers, a great portion of the community were not quite ready to give up the years of muscle memory accumulated from playing with a GameCube controller. Why do I need to switch to a box controller if I could keep playing on a GameCube controller and refine my already established tech and still get good results? As more people were getting box controllers, more people started modding their GameCube controllers. But these primitive mods such as analog stick notches and removing trigger springs were simply not enough to keep up with all of the additional benefits that box controllers have. GameCube controller players simply needed another solution to keep up ever since the ban of Arduinos in Melee. It was thought that UCF would fix the issues of one controller being better than another, but UCF didn't matter in the long run since box controllers were concretely superior. Much like many old heads in Smash, Dan Salvato wasn't predicting a future where potentially a majority of players switched to using a box controller. UCF also suffered from the hands of Nintendo, who made it clear that they did not like UCF as they have a no-tolerance policy on any sort of modification of the game's code, resulting in it being banned from a handful of major tournaments. UCF looked like it could be taken away from the community as quickly as it came. And as the times seemed to have gotten worse for controller players, the controller players will soon start getting some solutions. Pivot. Pivots are buttery! This is so cheap, dude, I'm telling you. I'm getting my shit next year. On May 27th of 2019, a well-respected Samus player from Colorado who goes by Goomy would drop the first ever video discussing his big project, the Goom Wave. 
Goom waves are GameCube controller motherboards that are capable of allowing your controller to make certain inputs similar to how you can on box through the use of analog remapping. And if you think this sounds kind of sus as a controller player, I'm not gonna lie, it kinda is. This type of analog remapping can borderline be considered as macros, setting this entire part of your C-Stick to give you a downward angle forward smash every time is drastically different to the area that regular GameCube controllers need to hit. And the fact that this could be done with an analog stick has major implications for the future of GameCube controllers. Despite the Arduino being banned for the use of macros, the Goomwave macros seem to mostly be ignored by the rest of the community. The Goomwave brought about a good amount of controversy upon release for this, leaving TOs to make a decision as to whether this controller will be banned in their tournaments. Ultimately, the Goomwave was not banned for the reason of if box controllers are allowed to perform these certain inputs, why can't I have access to those inputs as well on my controller if I pay the money to do so? We haven't really talked about the cost of owning a Goomwave, but from what I was able to find, a Goomwave motherboard costs $150. This is just the motherboard. No buttons, no sticks, no controller shell, nada. If you're not down to assemble your own controller, you have the option to buy a Goomwave controller from a various modders online for roughly $350 or more. That's not all that has to be paid though, as it also costs a bit of money to maintain this controller. A Goomwave is susceptible to experiencing a potentiometer oddity degradation effect, or POD, which is when the potentiometers under your control stick experiences wear and tear over time, leading to a change in your control stick and how it reads inputs. This POD is 99% the reason why your Switch controllers still have stick drift. Since Goomwave controllers experience potentiometer degradation, you need to constantly repair your controllers, specifically by replacing the potentiometers with better ones. Now, if you're a player who has collected a lot of controllers over time, you might have a lot of potentiometers stored up somewhere. But this constant part replacement adds yet another barrier to entry to the upper echelon of melee. Despite this issue, some players still think that to this day, the Goomwave is the best controller that you could possibly play on, due to all of the benefits that its analog remapping can bring. And despite all of the benefits this motherboard brings, allowing you to do things that are normally extremely difficult to perform, the controller was not banned, and is still legal to this day. Some of today's best players still use a Goomwave, with the two most notable players rooting for the Goomwave being Mango and Lucky. However, some people didn't like the Goomwave. They didn't like what its benefits entailed for the future of the Melee meta. They didn't appreciate paying this much money for a controller that is just as easy to degrade as any other average GameCube controller. Although it was looking better, GameCube controller players were still not having the best time compared to box controller players. They still needed another solution. And who would think that after all of these years of conflict, that this company would be the ones who would try to help and make this happen? Nintendo and esports organization Panda Global teamed up in efforts to create a new standard controller for competitive Smash. On December 1st of 2021, Panda would release their Kickstarter for the Panda controller. Panda Esports was looking to take over the Smash controller market for good. The goal of Panda was to create a brand new standard for how handheld Smash controllers are supposed to be. At first glance, this controller looks like as if a GameCube and a Switch Pro controller had a baby, with the controller having ZL and ZR buttons, as well as a minus and plus button to be dual compatible with the Switch as a wireless controller. The controller also has a unique design choice of having the shells connect to each other magnetically instead of using screws, allowing you to easily open and close your controller to help you tinker with it or mod it in any way that you please. Panda also kept style in mind, with a plan to open a storefront for different colored controller shells, buttons, and sticks. The Panda controller was not only made to be affordable and stylish, but was made with the goal of making every other handheld controller obsolete. They did this by making features that were previously only possible to unlock by paying $150 minimum for a Goomwave motherboard, 
available for just $90 with the purchase of their controller. Although Panda stated that the controller would not come with these features on release day due to no one really knowing if the compatibilities of the Goom Wave would result in controllers like this being banned, they promised that the controller would give you the ability to calibrate your notches similar to how a Goom Wave does, as well as allowing you to remap your jump to Z and consistently hitting the 1.0 cardinal. The controllers came with other benefits that were not yet to be seen in an official controller, such as using smooth buttons making it easier to slide your thumb from one button to another, having rubber tipped shield triggers to allow for easier finger grip, and two buttons on the leg of the controller which allow you to adjust the horizontal and vertical snapback of your controller. It also has two very unique qualities. The first one being that all controllers would come with memory chips inside of them, allowing Panda to automatically upgrade the controller's software through updates. The other quality is that the controller has space in the back for various kinds of expansion packs. It was planned for every controller to come packaged with a weight expansion pack, which allowed you to modify the weight of your controller making it as heavy or as light as you would like. Other expansion packs were planned, such as the wireless expansion pack to make the controller wireless. This controller that was planned to be mass produced and sold for $90 was a game changer. You can't even find decent controllers for less than $100 easily. Getting a brand new controller for less than $100 directly approved by Nintendo that could potentially be a better Goom Wave in every way was something that basically every GameCube controller player wanted. Panda knew precisely what the community wanted and needed. This new controller was wanted so bad that the Kickstarter for the controller was super successful, raising close to $2 million, with 14,600 backers paying $90 to receive a controller on release day, and 5 backers paying $1,000 for a gold-plated Panda controller. This controller was the real deal, which makes it such a shame that this controller would never see the light of day. What most people didn't know was that Panda was about to find themselves in the middle of a grand controversy. As the Panda controller was undergoing development, Smash World Tour was going on. Smash World Tour was an established tournament circuit that kept track of every player's records who attends a Smash World Tour approved tournament series, where a ton of local tournaments were approved. This heavily rewarded local resident sleepers to help them get noticed by other players, spectators, and maybe even a sponsor. However, on November 29th of 2022, what used to be a cornerstone of competitive melee starting in 2020, Smash World Tour's 2022 Championship Final and the circuit altogether would come to a close. Smash World Tour released an apology to the community for the abrupt cancel, and in this apology, they would claim to be forced by Nintendo to shut down the circuit due to difficulties of them obtaining the license to host these events. They would also accuse the CEO of Panda Global, Dr. Alan Bunny, of misconduct with several US tournament organizers. You see, Dr. Alan seemed to have wanted to build a Smash Empire. After Smash World Tour was active for two years, Dr. Allen aimed to make his own circuit for players to compete in called the Panda Cup, announcing it in May 26 of 2022. This brought about competition mainly in what tournaments, whether it's locals, the regionals, or majors, were deemed to be worthy of being counted on which circuit. It also resulted in many tournaments counting towards both circuits, and since Smash World Tour was already established, it was still leading in the market by quite a large margin. In an effort to minimize this margin and have more players interested in the Panda Cup, Allen would start doing some shady stuff. Allegedly. Allen started telling many TOs that the Smash World Tour circuit would actually be getting shut down shortly, and that if an event wanted to be approved for Panda Cup circuit, that it must not be approved by the Smash World Tour circuit. Dr. Allen lied to the members of the community for personal gain. This is someone deeply entrenched in the community sponsoring beloved players. They got the approval from Nintendo to make what was seeming to be the best handheld Smash controller on the market, and was also approved by Nintendo for a license to run their own circuit. Did Dr. Allen know that Nintendo was going to go after Smash World Tour? Did he ask for assistance in dealing with the unlicensed Smash World Tour? Honestly, 
This is just a lot of drama from huge organizations filled with many, many people. So we'll never truly know the outcome of all the potentially ugly politics that could have went into this outcome. Here's what we do know. It was confirmed that Allen was engaging in this manipulative behavior with several TOs around the US. Panda would also release a statement saying that Dr. Allen would be stepping down as CEO, resulting in the end of not only Smash World Tour, but Panda Cup as well. But what happened to the controllers, you may ask? Well, Panda wasn't having much luck with the Panda controllers either. It turns out that the manufacturing firm in China that they were dealing with were going through blackouts and ended up completely ghosting their request, resulting in the cancellation of the whole Kickstarter and an almost $2 million refund to every backer. Dr. Allen was without a doubt a community leader with a lot of power, and I honestly respect his aim to build a Smash Empire like other people in the community have built before him. However, his overzealous nature resulted in one of the biggest mishaps in competitive Smash history, leaving a lot of players feeling hopeless and leaving several employees out of jobs. Who knows how the Melee community would have been today with two competitive circuits and a brand new controller specifically tailored for this game. I guess GameCube controller players will just have to wait a little bit longer for another solution. Turns out that they didn't have to wait much longer, however. I wasn't able to find exactly when this was officially released, but here's what I was able to find. Around June 10th of 2022, that being what could possibly be the earliest release date that I was able to find online, GameCube controller modder Carvac would bless GameCube controller players. Carvac announced the FOB to the Melee world. The FOB is an open source GameCube controller motherboard that grants players access to features such as analog remapping, notch calibration, Z jump, dead zone alignment. Uh, okay, okay, what actually makes this different from a Goom Wave? They're both expensive motherboards that you need to buy from a third party, either assembled or DIY style, at various prices. The real innovation of the FOB is its use of Hall Effect sensors for their control sticks instead of using potentiometers. As we discussed earlier, the main weakness of the Goom Wave is that it requires more maintenance due to how common it is to have a bad pod. The FOB completely removes the need for constant maintenance since they use magnets instead of potentiometers, meaning there is no pod. It still suffers from a pretty high price point, but theoretically, it's supposed to be better in the price department since you don't have to spend extra money on spare parts just for repairs. The benefits from this controller were too much to pass up for a lot of players, especially since it did not go through any negative effects of Poad. This led to a ton of top players getting their own fobs to have a good, long-lasting controller. But hey, if you watched my most recent video, you probably know where we're going next. So fobs have this weird tendency to just break randomly, and we've seen it happen in tournaments several times with top players, interrupting the flow of high-stakes matches. The amount of FOB explosions has actually resulted in some players switching off of FOB because of all the times that they've happened to break. Despite this issue, the FOBs were still revolutionary for being open source, allowing many different modders from different walks of life to manufacture and sell these upgraded controllers. It helped increase the supply of excellent controllers that people can buy. But I'd like to bring this all back to where it started. When looking at the goals of UCF, it did a pretty decent job at making shield drops and backdashing easier, but when you look at its other goal, it seems like in the long run, the second step was never really completed. And it's not Dan Salvato's or UCF's fault. No one could have predicted a world where box controllers and their digital-only inputs could possibly reign supreme ever. No one could have predicted the rabbit hole players would have to go through to find the controller that is right for them. Yes, there are more controllers on the market now and more options for GameCube controller players than ever before, and they tend to be higher quality today compared to the controllers that you would get back in the day, especially with custom Goom Waves and FOBs. But finding a controller that you can officially label as your main controller is still a pretty expensive task. And sometimes, paying that much money on a FOB or a Goom Wave can still result in your controller shitting itself and becoming useless. And it's okay to not want to spend all this money on these fancy controller upgrades. We may not have digital-only inputs, 
and we may have lost the opportunity to have a universally excellent and ergonomic controller at an affordable price. And GameCube controller players love to talk about how broken the box is and how the box needs to be banned and all this, but altogether, GameCube controller players are making it seem like they've been going through this big rough patch for so many years. But in all honesty, it's not all that bad for us GameCube controller players. So far, ever since the box controllers were first invented, we have never seen a box user ever make it to the grand finals of a super major. The box has been around for over six years now. We've seen excellent performances on these controllers from Hax, Pipsqueak, Swift, and Zuppy, and we continue to see new upcoming box players performing better than ever such as NMW, Zealot, Gatsu, and Captain Smuckers. It seems that these box users have not yet surpassed the GameCube controller masters, but I feel like it shouldn't take much more time for these box players to get even stronger. To this very day, the controller debate has not been settled, and it's arguably more heated now than it's ever been before. There are still players calling these GameCube controller benefits such as notch calibration and Z-Jump broken, and saying that they should be banned. Um, the difference is, I think people get lost in that argument because they said I instantly switched to Z-Jump and was really good, but in reality I switched to Z-Jump and it took me a month back in early 2021 to get back to where I was, and you can go back to the stream somewhere, there's clips of them, where I was struggling to even jump cancel grab. It took me like two weeks to feel like I could play again, and then about a month before I was back to where I was. And I was still number three after I got that. However, it feels really wrong to ban an option on a traditional GameCube controller when these newer style box controllers can perform these actions a lot easier. Is the answer just to force nerfs on every box controller with more timed button lockouts? Is the answer to ban notch calibration and Z-Jump while leaving box controllers untouched? Hell, is the answer to ban all of these controllers and only make it legal to enter tournaments without a box, Goomwave, or FOB? Ideally, the best answer would be to implement these controller fixes as software mods for the game, as these problems were already fixed in a software mod called Melee 1.03, developed by Haxmoney and Altimore. But implementing this many changes to Melee's code and expecting Nintendo to just turn a blind eye given their track record with the Smash community is a little bit naive. It's either we make 1.03 a standard and lose all of Nintendo's support, or we don't make it the standard and we're in the same situation anyway. Now me personally, I don't see an issue with things such as Poe emulation, notch calibration, and input remapping. I just think that it kinda sucks that basic tools like this are stuck behind a paywall so that new players cannot take advantage of it. The whole point of UCF was to get rid of the inherent advantages that one GameCube controller would have over another limiting the amount of money that you gotta drop for a controller since you don't have to look for a controller with one of the best sticks on earth in order to compete at a high level. But it only seems like since UCF dropped, that this controller issue only got worse. Entering a melee tournament nowadays is probably the most intimidating thing to do. Given that this is a very old game with a very established meta, and all of these players are just popping out out of nowhere and winning against this guy and beating this guy and winning this tournament. And I bet the overabundance of controllers that we have in our market makes it even more intimidating for newer players. But all I'm saying is, don't be scared. Don't be worried about what somebody has to say about your controller, whether it's easier to play on or that it's broken or that it sucks. I would say try as many controllers as you can, and if you're not into using the box style controllers, that's okay. And if you're using a vanilla JP White controller with no notches, no type of mods or anything, that's also okay. Because at the end of the day, this game is to have fun. This is Juice Man. Have a good day. Thank you guys for joining. Uh, remember to support Smash Brothers, support all of our players. There's a lot going on in the scene right now, for sure. But at the end of the day, it's all about the melee, and I want to give a big shout out to all the players. Go Just ahead. remember one thing. One thing. You can try and take our melee away. You can take my controller, my GameCube, my CRT. I'll tell you something, I'll play melee in my fucking mind. As long as <laughs> melee lives, I will play, and if you take it all, we'll fucking play in a garage. 20 people there, hot, sweaty, gross, me versus Zane behind a 7-Eleven for 25 bucks. And that's what it's always going to be. 
Mm -hmm. You don't understand that the money, the fame, we don't, nobody gives, anybody who wants to be a top player gives no fucks about that. So if you try to shut us down, you'll never shut us down. You think you might, but I promise you with all my soul, you got nothing on the melee community. These fucks are the cockroaches of esports. <laughs> you try and kill them, they keep, can't kill them. These motherfuckers <laughs> just keep going, dude. So you can try. You're not going to succeed, whoever you are. Just remember that.